Welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. Just so you know, this is being recorded so that we can share it later for everyone who wasn't able to attend. Um, I will keep admitting people as they pop in. Like I said, feel free to turn your camera on if you want or leave it off. It's completely up to you. Dusty, I'm going to give you um, sharing abilities right now before I forget. Okay. <laughs> so feel free to start that up whenever you're ready. Um, I just wanted to do a few shout outs. We really appreciate you joining us today, the Public Relations Society of America, Southeastern Wisconsin chapter. Perfect, Dusty, I can see it. Uh, before we jump into today's program, I did wanna let you know that we do have three summer socials lined up for this summer and they are going to be live and in person. We're really excited about that. They're gonna be outdoors. So we're going to make sure that we're, you know, um, following all of our COVID best practices um, the first will be Wednesday, June 23rd at Estabrook Deer Garden. The second one will be Wednesday, July 21st at hum the Vine Humboldt Beer Garden. And then the third will be August 25th, another Wednesday at the landing at Hoyt Park. So that's coming up. We're excited about that. If you have any questions along the way, please feel free to type them in the chat. Um, and we will answer them as they come in. But I think that's all I have to say. So Dusty, I will hand it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Christine. And thank you to PRSA of Southeast Wisconsin as well for uh, inviting us out to uh, talk about a topic that frankly, I could talk about all afternoon uh, if Christine would let me. But we're going to try to keep it to a lean 45 minutes here. Podcasting, of course, kind of a hot topic right now, not just in the realm of public relations, but in marketing content, marketing more broadly. And podcasting, of course, presents a lot of really unique opportunities uh, right now. If you're looking to position yourself as a thought leader, if you're looking to generate new leads for the business or provide added value to engage your customers or members. Um, and of course, it creates a great pretext as well for B2B interaction with potential clients. As I have discovered, as I've tried to grow my business here, a couple of key takeaways uh, that are uh, going to come about as part of this presentation. And the first here is that podcast listenership is blowing up. It has been for about the last 10 years, and it doesn't look like that's going to be changing anytime soon. So if you are a brand or a company or an association looking to get into the podcasting space, then I would advise you to focus on the quality of the content that you're creating, not the quantity. For a long time in podcasting, people were like, oh, just put out as much stuff as you can. It doesn't matter if it sounds good or not. Just focus on filling that feed. We're entering a new phase in the podcast game, I would posit. And it's important that your podcast is not only a presence, but it sounds better than everybody else's as well. As with all content marketing, it's important to focus on informing and entertaining first, on providing value to your listeners or consumers, not just hitting them with the sales pitch right out the bat, because a 45-minute sales pitch is called an infomercial and people hate those. And finally, uh, in the era of post-COVID that we seem to be moving into right now, uh, we're able to really take advantage of the fact that People have learned how to use Zoom. I don't know if there's a, a, a more blunt way to put that, um, but there's a lot of virtual competence uh, that people have developed over the last year, and it allows us to produce podcasts that sound very, very good virtually. So we'll tell you a little bit more about that down the line, too. First, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm the president and founder of PodCamp Media. We are a Milwaukee-based podcast production agency specifically focused on businesses and providing them with the quality service that they need. I also host a podcast called Lead Balloon, which was named last fall by Adweek as 2020's Marketing Podcast of the Year, which was uh, an exciting feather in my cap. We'll be telling you a little bit more about that. And I'm joined today uh, by Carrie Straits, uh, with whom I have had the great opportunity to work uh, over the last six or seven months here. A little bit longer, in fact, now that I think about it. Um, but Carrie, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Sure. Thank you for having me, folks. And I want to give a shout out to Community Foundations FV. You're launching your podcast in June. So exciting. Can't wait to hear any questions you might have uh, from someone on the other side of having launched a podcast. Um, I am currently head of demand generation for Mode Analytics. Uh, when we launched this podcast, I was at a prior company as director of digital marketing. 
uh, under which uh, fell content under my purview. And um, a podcast targeted at small business owners, which was our audience, just seemed to be a really great fit to expand our reach and uh, grow top funnel awareness while also giving our customers uh, some good word of mouth opportunities to talk about your payroll with their friends and family who may need our service. So um, I have tons of experience in demand gen. Content is just one small piece of it. Uh, and content, uh, specifically podcasts, are another small piece of content. So um, I've been in the field for 15 plus years. Emphasis on the plus. It's been fun to watch how things have changed. And I look forward to sharing how we launched our podcast with you all. Carrie is going to be providing the legitimacy, i.e. the case study in this presentation here. But first, a, a little bit more about how I wound up in this space. I have been working behind a microphone right now for going on 20 years. Uh, this is actually where I got my start behind a microphone. We called it the chalet in the valley, but really it was more of a shack in a cornfield. W-E-K-Z in Monroe, Wisconsin, home of the Fighting Cheesemakers football broadcasts. Uh, we really were a shack in a cornfield. It was a thousand watt AM station along with a couple of FMs. But uh, when you were on the AM side, as I was there reading the news, uh, we were talking primarily to dairy farmers uh, who were out working with their herd or working in their fields. So uh, it was the quintessential uh, Wisconsin experience there. Um, after that, I went off and studied at the University of Wisconsin, uh, majored in the journalism school there uh, before taking my first full-time job in broadcast at Madison 1670 WTDY. I got to follow the Badgers to the Rose Bowl, which was great, and uh, spent a lot of time covering uh, the state capitol there. Um, before I was uh, called up to the big leagues, as they say, and went off to the wonderful Isle of Dreams, WIODAM in Miami, Florida. Uh, covered the Miami Heat in the NBA Finals when uh, LeBron James got his first ring uh, and uh, spent my days off flying around in the traffic copter because that was a fun thing to do. Uh, I also became a correspondent for the CBS radio network, the Fox News radio network, and a uh, number of uh, smaller uh, national outlets as well. Uh, stuck around Miami for a little while, but eventually my Wisconsin roots brought me back here to the Milwaukee area, where I took a job as the public relations supervisor at Milwaukee City Hall, uh, serving as the chief media relations and public relations uh, contact, or one of them, for uh, all 15 members of Milwaukee's Common Council. I worked there for about five years-ish before I took a content marketing role at the Association of Equipment Manufacturers based here out of Milwaukee, one of the world's largest trade associations uh, uniting companies like Bobcat and Caterpillar and John Deere, the producers of big, heavy construction and agriculture equipment, helping get their members engaged in the new and emerging technology space via the content marketing initiative that we oversaw. Based on my background in broadcasting, uh, one of the things that we wanted to do at AEM was produce a podcast for our members. And so uh, we did that entirely in-house and uh, went about setting our goals, setting our plans for it, launched it, and then immediately blasted our goals out of the water by a factor of about 10 times. Uh, the podcast was significantly more successful than anybody, including me, expected it to be. And it got to the point where my phone started to ring. People were calling and asking me, we think it's really cool what you did with the AEM podcast. How do we do it for our brand? And... I had never really had an entrepreneurial bone in my body up to that point, but I saw an opportunity. I saw a demand for services and, and not a very great supply in it. And so took the leap, started PodCamp Media, signed AEM as my first client so I could continue to produce their podcast for them. But since then, we've been working to build out our portfolio of clients. And they now include, as Carrie mentioned, Sure Payroll, one of the world's leading providers of online payroll services for small and micro businesses. Their podcast, Back of the Napkin, is targeted to that audience, and they use it as a lead generation opportunity. We also produce the podcast for the National Corn Growers Association, based out of St. Louis. And they use their podcast really as uh, uh, an opportunity to uh, inform and engage their membership, uh, which is scattered all across the country, of about um, 60,000 dues-paying members and 300,000 checkoff contributing corn farmers uh, to keep them informed about the issues that they need to hear. And then the State of Wisconsin Investment Board is a client as well. 
Uh, they manage the pension fund for 650,000 state municipal employees and retirees in the state of Wisconsin who all have a vested interest, literally speaking, in how their money is managed. And of course, we produce the Lead Balloon podcast, to which I referred earlier, selected by Adweek as 2020 uh, Marketing Podcast of the Year. Um, If you want to pull your phone out and subscribe to Lead Balloon, it would not break my heart. We're very proud of the work that we do on that podcast because it's relevant to public relations and marketing professionals, but it's not just another podcast where we're sitting around talking about a topic of the week or these are the best practices that we're going to cover this week. It's about people in this field telling the stories about the oh crap moments that they've had in their career, what went wrong, how they overcame it, and the lessons that they learned. It was like a slow motion car accident. And I was like saying to myself, oh no, this isn't happening. This doesn't read like the normal FBI press release. You know, swung around my chair, looking at my boss, David, goes, yeah, I don't think we're supposed to have this. We were just shocked and didn't know what to do, hoping that we still got the shot. (laughs) Needless to say, none of us were ready to do battle with a multinational big beer behemoth. Holy cow, that thing you did, you stepped in it. Had you walked in half of the other offices here, you'd be walking out with your pink paper right now here today. You want to communicate to them. You want to tell them what you are doing as a company to protect them. McDonald's is one of the most fiercely protected companies of their own brand. I think the other media companies, if they would have been financially sound, would have picked up on it. This is a field that draws in creative people. Sometimes chews them up and spits them out. I'm Dusty Weiss from PodCamp Media, and we'll rehash those stories because sometimes there are valuable lessons to be learned. Sometimes it just feels good to hear about someone else's disaster. You could be having a crisis and a catastrophe behind the scenes, but as long as it all stays behind the curtain, that's, that's what you want. Lead Balloon is national in scope. Recent guests have included a former spokesperson for American Airlines talking about the time that she got sent to Columbia to represent the company following a terrible plane crash when she was just three weeks into her job. Uh, Another recent episode includes the uh, former vice president of communications at Coca-Cola talking about the time that they got dragged into a really uncomfortable situation because of the men-only membership policy at the Augusta National Golf Club, where they were a sponsor of the Masters Tournament in golf at the time. Uh, and we even uh, did an episode not too long ago uh, with a former staffer for the Dukakis 88 campaign talking about the ill-fated tank photo op that is so infamous in our field. Uh, But we have uh, some local ties as well. In fact, uh, if you tune into episode four of the podcast, you will hear former PRSA of Southeast Wisconsin President Patrick McSweeney explaining why he is covered in paint in this particular photo right there. So, Patrick, I told you I was going to work you into the presentation here. It's an awesome story if you haven't heard that one from him before. It's, uh, It's just a lot of fun to hear him tell it. So a quick overview, what's so great about podcasting right now? Well, first and foremost, it is doing to audio uh, what we have seen Netflix and Hulu and other on-demand video services do to video. Podcast listenership is increasing because when people want to listen to audio content, they want to listen to it on their schedule. They want to start it when they want to start it, and they want to stop it when they want to stop it, and so on and so forth. Monthly podcast listenership is growing. Weekly podcast listenership Uh, has pretty much doubled over just the last four or five years here. Uh, This number, these numbers, by the way, are from Edison. Um, It's growing across demographics here. And uh, when Edison asked how many podcasts, weekly podcast listeners are listening to, that number is up to eight right now. Um, This is my favorite slide in the entire deck uh, because when Edison asked monthly podcast listeners, how much of a typical episode they're listening to, 93% of them said they're listening to most or all of a podcast episode. And that's crazy because I don't have to tell you guys that 
attention spans are shorter than they've ever been right now. Most people engage with a typical piece of Facebook content for about a second and a half. Most people abandon a website if it takes more than three seconds to load. The attention span for a video on YouTube, not an ad, but the actual video people that uh, the actual video that people want to be watching is still only about two and a half minutes. And somehow, somehow in podcasting, we get people's attention for 45 minutes at a stretch. So it's created a terrific opportunity for brands that want to move into this space. Trader Joe's, GE, McDonald's, REI does a podcast that I actually listen to. And now very recently, our clients at Sure Payroll have moved into this space with a branded podcast of their own. This ought to go in just a second. There it goes. On today's episode, we'll be talking to Pete Leonard, who's the owner of I Have a Bean in Wheaton, Illinois. He's basically found a business model that combines brewing a great cup of coffee with giving back to his community in the process. Illinois has, at the moment, the second highest recidivism rate in the country. It's over 50%. So recidivism, meaning somebody gets out of prison, And within three years, they go back to prison. Having the ability to work reduces recidivism and by a lot. And we do track that here at I Have a Bean. Um, If Illinois' recidivism rate is above 50%, ours is right now less than 3%. It's actually less than 2% right now. And there's no magic here. All I'm doing is giving them an opportunity to work and expecting them to be great at what they do. So we like to say on back of the napkin that every entrepreneur has an origin story, sort of like uh, superheroes. And we like to tell those origin stories in a way that is compelling and engaging and helps generate leads and top of funnel uh, 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 potential for sure payroll. And with a case study about how this project came about and how it was rolled out, supported and executed, I give you Carrie Straits. Hello. So uh, I'm going to walk you through our strategy, our business case, how we actually operationalized the podcast, um, and uh, yeah, how we launched the baby, went to market, and what our first month results were. So the strategy behind our podcast was a long-term content strategy. You can't, in my opinion, start something like a podcast or a blog and be like, we're going to start a blog, and then not plan beyond the first like three blog posts, right? That's how your blog ends up in the dusty corners of the internet with no one visiting. So I went into this with my team with a long-term strategy mindset of like 12 to 18 months. Um, And I talked a little bit earlier about um, this being a way to increase our top funnel brand awareness now that we would have really great content to put through all of our demand gen um, channels. But also this gave our customers an opportunity to share our content um, and also drive referral business for us. So For Sure Payroll, this would operationalize two new funnel uh, components, upper funnel, mid funnel, upper funnel, and bottom funnel uh, for referrals. Um, It gave us referral marketing opportunities for our customers. And then it really gave us a great opportunity to cross-pollinate our content uh, with derivative content from the podcast. So how could we use the transcripts on the podcast to drive SEO value? How could we use the podcast to create um, blog posts, definitive guides, infographics, and things like that, that we just weren't really working on at the time. So if you go to the next slide, Dusty. Um, first, so let me tell you how I found PodCamp. Dusty's heard the story a thousand times. I was um, I never get on. tired of it, though. <laughs> I have I have a little interesting piece I haven't shared with you yet, which is why I was so interested in Lead Balloon. Um, I was on Reddit. Is sometime last summer, looking at some, I don't know, marketing subreddit. And the topic was, what podcast do you listen to? And one of the posts had Lead Balloon in it and what it was about, like, you know, great fails. And the other um, was Everyone Hates Marketers. And I wanted to listen to Lead Balloon because I was just coming off of a horrific fail. It was like June, so COVID was kind of dying down. We were redoing our national television commercial to move away from some of the, like, we're here for you COVID content towards PPP content. And my brand designer in the commercial transposed two numbers in the R1-800 number, which turned out to be an adult friend finder phone number. (laughs) (laughs) Did not tell you that. How have you never told me this? I was embarrassed. (laughs) This huge fail needed a little pick me up to listen to other the marketers huge fail so if that's your bag like hit up lead balloon um i just found it through a, a crazy fluke 
but it really made me start to think like podcasts might actually work for my company specifically if I can put in my own ads that stay evergreen and so I'd like kick this idea around um, and I decided to take a look at some of our competitors and thought if they're doing it there's got to be some legs here and two of our competitors one was ADP uh, I'm going to give the num- company names away here um, they were company B so they are theirs is hosted by I think Mark Cuban of Shark Tank like they just have this big marquee named talent they just pump out a ton of content the other company was our parent company, Paychex. Uh, they, uh, on a monthly basis, will hire well-known brand names to come and host. Um, so both of these are huge billion-dollar companies, and both of them are heavy into podcasts. And I was like, okay, all right. There's a home in this market for us. If these two monolithic companies are podcasting, we've definitely got to be here. But I don't know how to do a podcast, and neither does no one on my team. Um, so we needed some help. So if you want to go to the next slide, Dusty. So I brought in my project team. Um, this was myself, uh, I had a manager of digital, my senior content specialist, senior marketing specialist, and my digital spe- specialist. So we had a pretty big team. They were all only like 10 to 15% allocated to this project. Um, I served as leadership sponsorship, and then we knew we needed uh, professional hosting, and we knew we needed professional help, quite frankly. We didn't want to make the podcast that died after, after three episodes. Um, So I'll go on through agency selection later, um, but I do want to cover our format. There's a ton of different ways you can do a podcast, and Dusty was 100% instrumental in helping us figure out what we wanted to do, whether it was, you know, a monthly um, podcast, was it weekly, did we want to release seasons? We ultimately um, went with the season approach. Uh, We just uh, launched season two. I think they're getting ready for season three now. Um, but it was going to be privately branded. So we called it back up the napkin. We brought in a brand advisor to help us go through some branding exercises and what to call this, how to brand it, what was the look and feel like. Um, and every podcast will have uh, four full, full episodes and two shorts that are sort of derived out of the full episodes and whatever interesting content uh, comes out of them. We decided to make them. I think this is no surprise after I just told my fail story. Uh, a Friday fail segment where small business owners actually shared like their one thing they went, oops, that was really bad. And what did they learn from it? Like, oops, don't transpose two phone numbers in your national ad or it will go somewhere bad or just, you know, call the number as you're proofreading it. Um, We decided on two hosts, one male, one female. And we also were pretty strict about adhering to our inclusion and diversity guidelines in terms of Um, gender, people of color, LGBTQ, both representation in our hosting, as well as our special guest mixes. And then the last bullet point to me as a demand gen professional was the most important. This is the idea that we can put ads in each episode, but as our promotions change and as our offers and market change, we can retroactively go back and change those ads in older episodes. So I will have evergreen advertising in my content, which I loved personally. We also, the plan is to also take um, these live recordings of the podcast and then sort of massage them into YouTube content um, and offer some specials or something different, a little bit uh, different for YouTube, like bloopers or highlight reels, and then um, ensure that we have closed captions on for the SEO value on YouTube. Before we launched, I really um, uh, tested my team and said, all right, you guys think there's value here. I think there's value here. We need to have a planned content calendar to share with leadership so we can say, we don't just want to make a podcast and we don't really know what we're going to talk about. It's we want to make a podcast. Here's why. And here's two quarters worth of content and what we're going to talk about. That includes the thematic hook, um, any special episodes, any shorts. And then we actually started planning out our guests And the guest outreach was probably the most difficult part. I think it's maybe no surprise. We reached out to some customers that we already had really friendly relationships with. Um, The self-imposed inclusion and diversity guidelines made this a little bit more challenging, but I'm really proud of the team for one, bringing them up and for two, for their diligence and um, commitment to ensuring that we represent underrepresented voices. That's really important. And so going through this editorial calendar here helps us do one last stop check of like, all right, are we following our inclusion and diversity guidelines? Do we have a hook? Do we have our shorts? We're all scheduled, we're planned, we're ready. 
And the last part, this is like the most critical part of producing a podcast, other than understanding that it's got to be a long-term play. It is how do you go to market with it? You need to build your audience. You're not going to be able to release a podcast or a blog or a YouTube channel and they're not just going to come. You have to draw people in, right? So we created a section on our website and each podcast episode got their own unique page. So whenever we did advertisements for that specific episode, we could send them to that page and drive website traffic. Uh, this gave us great content for all of our social, both organic and paid. Um, we also did YouTube advertising for our YouTube channel to drive people there. Um, one of our more successful, uh, about fourth bullet down, our more successful um, channels was programmatic display ads. So this is a flavor of display that relies on a DSP that serves programmatic ads really cheaply and efficiently. You can find the people you want to get in front of really quickly. Um, it's really great. We also promoted things like in our customer newsletter, and we had an internal employee contest that ran for each um, episode of season one, where we incented employees to leave a five-star review, uh, subscribe, or um, what was it? Subscribe, a review. Dusty, help me. Uh, I think yeah, uh, or the five stars, subscribe, five stars. and comment. Those Got are the biggies. It. Um, so we ran the internal contest. We had 300 employees internally. Uh, there was one winner per week based on how many activities they took. So it was another way to sort of start slowly building an organic audience where there really wasn't one. Agency selection. I think this is really important to know. Clearly, we went with PodCamp, but I had to do my due diligence. Um, and I had to look at three uh, agencies for this. So first, I looked at PodCamp. I had heard about them from this crazy podcast, La Balloon. Um, it worked for me, the advertising. Things to know, they were a startup company, still are a startup company. Um, deep, deep experience and passion for podcasting was very clear to me. Um, at the time, lean staff, I'd say staff of one, no longer staff of one, <laughs> but small crew, um, a very high commitment to production quality, very high commitment, um, which wasn't something I even knew was really a thing until um, Dusty and I started talking and he played like clips without good production and then clips after good production. And and that's when you really hear like taking out the ums and the uhs and the <laughs> it's so important. Um, PodCamp also would provide extra coaching. I mentioned none of us have ever made a podcast before, so we needed a lot of hand-holding and PodCamp also provided hosting services, which we also needed. We talked about doing it ourselves, but like drawing out a story and telling a story is just not our expertise for demand gen marketers. Um, so we knew we needed a host. The other agency I looked at was almost the complete opposite of PodCamp. Um, they'd been in business for over 10 years. They had a very, very streamlined, efficient project management system. We would produce an episode every X amount of weeks. Production quality was okay. They were like, yeah, you might hear the neighbor's dog barking in the background. We're not really going to be taking that out. You're just going to have to deal with it, which I didn't love. They were less expensive, um, but only by maybe 10%. Um, but they did for, uh, provide hosting and go-to-market support. So that was helpful. The last group I looked at was our own internal team. We had a team of our parent company, Paychex four guys in a booth who produced their podcasts. Um, I wasn't going to really be saving any money because their time was going to be billed back to me anyways. They weren't really going to be providing the coaching that we needed. Um, we would be subject to internal delays. So if other projects came up, we'd get bombed. So I quickly um, removed the internal team from my list. Uh, it just wasn't a good fit. And looked at agency B as well as PodCamp. I ultimately decided if I'm going to get a similar work product, I'd like the extra coaching, um, and I'd like to be able to help a startup startup get off the ground. Um, it was not without risk. Dusty can attest. I said this is very risky for me, <laughs> sticking my neck out for you uh, as a newer company. I do want to give you my business, and he he said and he delivered. Um, I won't. I won't miss a deadline. I will not miss this. Uh, and he delivered it. He's delivered on every season so far. Um, so we're very happy with our choice. And so are we. We're so ah. happy. <laughs> In terms of a business case, this is how I sold it to my leadership. Um, so I asked for a two-season investment in both podcast and YouTube content. Um, I actually did a 30-day report out because we were so excited to see the results instead of a 90-day. 
Uh, but the idea was if we can drive 5% more website traffic, we know how many visits it takes to convert to a lead. And we know how many leads typically convert uh, into a new customer. So if we drove 5% of incremental new website traffic, we thought we could generate about 330 leads, which for some context, that's about what we drive through Google paid search in one day. So kind of a smaller volume, but a good cost per lead for us. Uh, and then we would net about 33 new clients a month, which is also about what we net from Google paid in a day. Um, so I can go through the results of what we actually saw in the first 30 days. Um, one month after our first episode launched, just a shy of 28,000 page views from 19,000 unique visitors, Whew. which amounted to over 6% increase in website traffic. So in one month, we exceeded our goal. We had just shy of 2,000 downloads. Now, what we had been told by our parent company was the main factor or the main KPI you're looking at with a podcast is downloads. And they had done some external research and the number they decided on per season uh, as a good KPI for downloads was something like 130. Dusty, I don't know if you can vet that or verify that, but that's the number they, they gave us. <clears throat> I um, think that's an easily attainable goal. <laughs> I think so, huh, Dusty? <laughs> <laughs> Fair to say we, we definitely exceeded that, um, even though we released a whole season and across a couple of weeks, it's still like six, seven, eight hundred downloads would have been the KPI. So we still exceeded that. Um, 1,100 listeners, 17 five-star ratings. Remember that employee contest I mentioned to you? This is where it pays off in terms of like app store optimization, things like ratings, downloads, subscribers, comments, all help you move up to the top of the list in the rankings. Um, and then we got 2.2 million impressions on Facebook, LinkedIn, and programmatic display. And yes, we, of course, we paid for those impressions, but those are impressions um, targeted towards micro and small business owners based on similar profiling within Salesforce. So we're getting our ads in front of important people who could use our product. Um, so these were pretty great results. I want to share with you the behavior flow. This is a little hard to see from Google Analytics, but the big white box on the left, that is the podcast sort of like hub on our website. And so we can see that when people come to the podcast hub, either by clicking a link in a, um, an episode profile or a social link or display banner, they tend to come and stay on additional podcast content. So that's great. They're not just coming and bouncing. They're actually coming and consuming more podcast content, which is wonderful. The thing we don't see on here, which my leadership was fine with, given the great results that we had gotten at the top of the funnel was it wasn't generating leads. Um, but that's a fine trade-off if you're bringing 19,000 unique small businesses to your company. As a first stop, that's fantastic because then you just sort of cookie them and retarget them and get them back to your website through other means. Um, but this was a really successful first season. We launched season two. We should start measuring it soon. I'm not there anymore. I know they will. And then moving into season three. Um, so with that, I think this is all I've got, Dusty. I think it's back to you. I think I'll pick up the ball and run with it. Thank you so much, Carrie. And yeah, I cannot believe. So when Carrie and I first started talking, um, and she reached out because she had listened to Lead Balloon and, and I told her about the company and what we do. And then I said, by the way, I've got this podcast, Lead Balloon, and I'm always looking for guests who have a great story about something that went crazy wrong on a campaign that she worked. Do you do you know anybody, anybody like that? And she goes, nope, don't have any stories like that. So to hear about your adult friend finder thing now... I'm a little hurt, Gary. I had, I had a reputation. <laughs> I had to act like a communications professional. <laughs> well, as they say, comedy equals tragedy plus time. So maybe with a little more time gone by, we can get you to tell that story maybe. on uh, on Let Balloon. <laughs> So the podcast production process, uh, let's kind of take a look now at uh, looking at the case study that Carrie gave us how that plays into this process right here. When I'm taking a client through the process of creating and producing a podcast, these are the five main steps that I delineate. And, and when Carrie and her team approached us here at PodCamp, uh, they were pretty deep into that main first step there. They had the planning and strategy done. And, and frankly, I could advise and provide some consulting on some of these steps, but they had a really good idea what their objectives were. They knew their target audience better than I could, and I was learning from them on that particular 
uh, piece. But then when you're launching a podcast, you've got to figure out your branding. Uh, and, and everything comes back to those first two points. You want to serve your objectives and you want to serve your target audience as much as possible. So the show format, the cadence, how often you're putting it out, uh, your editorial calendar planning, all that goes back to who is your target audience and how are you going to best serve them? How are you going to speak to them in their language? Next, we get to the pre-production part of the process. And, and once you get through planning and strategy, uh, these are all steps that happen on cadence now. You're doing this for every single episode, but you're reaching out to your guests. You're getting them scheduled. You're writing a script and outlining the topics that you're going to cover in a given episode, prepping the guests. And even at PodCamp, uh, when we were uh, uh, pretty early on uh, and the pandemic set in, we realized that we were going to be recording everything virtually for a while. Uh, I kind of toyed with the idea for a little while of how do we make it sound like we still have everybody sitting in the same room together, even though we're spread out across the world in a lot of cases. And very quickly settled on the simplest, cheapest way to do that and do it right, being just sending a $75 microphone to every participant in our client's podcasts because, uh, because anything else, because that deep into the pandemic, people were already tired of Zoom calls. And so if your podcast sounds like a Zoom call, it's an instant strike against it. People aren't going to tune back in it. So we uh, send microphones to all of our clients' podcast guests, and they get to keep the microphone as sort of a thank you gift for uh, being on the podcast. Next, then, you've got the uh, recording part of the process, and, and this is where podcast, uh, PodCamp really steps up to, uh, to shine, I think, uh, because uh, we use some pretty advanced podcast recording services. They're done all online, but they capture all of the participants on their individual audio tracks, meaning that you can make adjustments to one person's audio track and not impact everybody else. So if a fire truck goes by in the background, if a dog's barking in the background, you can pull that down without destroying the rest of the audio there. Uh, similarly, we use redundant taping because things often go wrong when you're recording live audio. And the worst phone call in the world that you'll ever have to make, I had to do this once uh, when I was a reporter in Madison, I had to call up then representative, now Senator Tammy Baldwin's office and say, hey, that 15 minute interview I just got with the representative, uh, the tape player ate it. Can, uh, can you work her in to have the exact same conversation with me again this afternoon? And they laughed at me and hung up. You don't ever want to make that call with your client's guests. And so we record in triplicate on three different systems. So we don't ever have to do that. We're triply redundant. Um, whether or not you need a show host, uh, that's something that we can provide, or that's something that we can coach people up to be their own podcast hosts. And whether you're going to record video that you want to use later, that's great to have. Whether you want to live stream your podcast taping, those are questions that you have to answer as well. The post-production process, I would argue, is the most important step because you're taking all of the good work that you've done through planning and strategy, through pre-production, through recording, and if you don't put the effort into post-production, it can still turn out sounding really mediocre. And so when I say that we edit podcasts, I'm not just talking about going through and making one to two edits across the body of a 45-minute podcast interview. We average about 10 edits per minute. That's four to 500 edits per podcast episode. And so we're going in, we're editing for content. We're making sure that it's clear and concise what people are saying, but we're actually editing down to the syllable, the verbal ticks, the uhs, the ums, the little imperfections in speech. Those add up and they add to listener fatigue. And so the more you're able to eliminate that, the more professional and polished your podcast guests and hosts sound, uh, and frankly, the more fun it is for your listeners to listen. So here's an example of what First, that I'm going to up play for you a uh, clip of the before. This is the raw audio and how it sounded before we edited it. It's often associated with with the debt cycle or the credit cycle. This was different because it was more like a natural disaster. And so what you hear here, so this was caused more by. Um, There's an um, a force of nature, like a hurricane or an earthquake, and a lot of long pauses. A volcano. So, it's a. It's not necessarily and there. He repeated it a and then restarted his sentence. That um, that um, long pause, uh, lip smack, imploded. 
it was a another long a virus, pause. a pandemic uh, that led to social distancing, and the social distancing uh, did great, great damage to the global economy. Here's a really long pause. I think underneath that is um, this is not a black swan. This is not something that is uh, happening for the first time in history. Um, this was easily anticipated. And so what and we're I able to do that, uh, through editing here is essentially clean up a lot of that dead space, the uhs, the ums, uh, the parts where he restarts his sentence. We're able to do that in a manner that is undetectable, but makes it just a lot easier to listen to. And so here's an example of how that winds up sounding after I'm done with it. And each time you see this red line cross one of these white and black lines, that's an edit that you're hearing. It's often associated with the debt cycle or the credit cycle. This was different because it was more like a natural disaster. This was caused more by a force of nature, like a hurricane or an earthquake. So, so as you see, it's not these necessarily edits are undetectable, a market variable edit, that edit. imploded. It was a edit. virus, a pandemic uh, that led to social distancing, and the social distancing edit. did great, great damage to edit. the global economy. This edit. is not a black swan. Edit. This is not something that Edit. is uh, happening for the first time in history. Edit. This was Edit. easily anticipated. Edit. And we're done. And what you see there is the end result is what was originally one minute of audio. Uh, we got across to the listener in 35 seconds there. So the way that I look at that is we're taking your listeners and giving them 25 seconds of their lives back. I had a station manager when I worked in radio, and, and he was fond of saying, your radio program, or in this case, your podcast, is like a party. And if you invite people to a party one time and they show up and they get food poisoning, they're not going to come to the next party that you throw. And a podcast is similar because if somebody tunes into your podcast once and uh, gets a bad impression of it, they're not going to tune in again. And they're going to take that bad impression away and, and apply it to your brand. And so we strive to make sure that everybody sounds their best all the time. It also makes it easier to get people to agree to be guests on your podcast. If you can assure them, no, don't worry, we're going to make you sound as good, if not better than Barack Obama, they're a lot more willing to step up and be guests on your podcast. Um, so then, of course, uh, we uh, provide a transcript of every podcast episode. As Carrie noted, that's a great opportunity to put that up on the website and drive search engine optimization. Uh, that's a great way to repurpose content and, and turn that into uh, uh, a Q&A for the email newsletter or a blog post on the website. Podcasts in general generate between twelve and 14,000 words per episode. And so that's just a lot of content that can be repurposed for other purposes. Then, of course, finally, there's the distribution angle of producing a podcast. Uh, you've got to give it a place to live. In our case, we use Megaphone, which is uh, one of the leading sort of uh, uh, branded and, and, and really just industry leaders in podcast distribution. Um, they were recently bought up by Spotify, in fact, um, and... Uh, then uh, you want to put it out to your email subscribers. You want to put it on the website. You want to put it on your social media. Um, video winds up being a great opportunity to help promote the podcast on social media, but also to repurpose the content and, and get it to a different audience as well. Um, and then you're going to want to be able to check your metrics and uh, see how that's all working out. So here's that process again. Uh, what we wind up doing at PodCamp is, is taking that process and really divvying it out. We are capable of, of handling most of these steps, but we find that in cases of planning and strategy and, and distribution, a lot of the times our clients know their audience better and we just consult. We let them manage that part of the process. We manage the parts that they don't want to do um, either because it's just a lot of work. You know, the editing that we do on a typical episode typically runs 12, 14 or 16 hours even. Uh, that's a, a lot of person hours there. Um, and so we do the parts that they don't want to do or just can't do and, and make sure that it uh, sounds great in the process. Um, a couple other things to note here. Uh, I, I do see that we're running a little short on time and I want to leave time for uh, questions. Um, but dynamic podcast content is a really cool feature uh, that's offered by the more advanced 
podcast platforms out there like Spotify's Megaphone. And essentially what this allows us to do is if you see here, this is the, uh, the waveform of your entire podcast episode. And you can go through uh, a, a podcast episode is typically uh, static. It doesn't change. You put out an episode uh, in September and by the time June rolls around, that episode still sounds exactly the same. But if you want to include evergreen content, if you want to reference, let's say you have an upcoming trade show that you want to promote, or you have a promo code, or you have a certain web page that you want to drive traffic to, and that changes from month to month, what you can do is you can define a location in the podcast episode. And when somebody downloads that episode, it will inject your latest piece of dynamic content into that spot. So if you're listening in September versus if you're listening in June, you'll hear the same podcast episode, but you will hear a different piece of content at that dynamic content insertion point. Um, and that's really cool because now you can geo-target that. So if you want uh, your audience on the West Coast to hear a different message versus people on the East Coast, you can do it that way. If you have a trade show coming up in Dallas, uh, you can define the Dallas DMA to hear one message and your general listeners to hear another message. It's just a really a powerful tool for uh, marketers and, and public relations professionals to uh, activate. And then, of course, you want to have good, solid metrics reporting because everything needs to be trackable. You need to be able to report on the results of the project. And we're capable now to uh, very broadly uh, report the metrics of not just how many people listen to the episode, um, but sort of broadly how long they're listening for, what tech platforms they're using. Are they on an Apple device or a, a Google device? Are they listening on a, a desktop computer? what country they're listening from, what state, all the way down to township, if you want to drill down that deep. And uh, there are even applications right now working to provide more democratic, uh, uh, excuse me, demographic reporting there. I'm going to skip over the five rules for content marketing with a podcast here because we've already sort of covered it, but uh, I'm uh, happy to talk you through that sometime if you're interested, because there are just a, a few things I wanted to include here at the end about the DIY aspect of podcasting. And again, obviously, I make my living telling people podcasting is a big, complex process. Please let me come in and handle that for you. But if you want to do some of this in-house, uh, there are a few absolute must-haves. And the first comes down to your microphone. Absolutely, positively, do not cheap out on getting a microphone. There are a lot of great options out there that are very affordable. Uh, they plug via USB right into your computer. And, uh, and, and elevate you again above sounding like a simple Zoom call because your, pod, your podcast has got to be a little more present than that. It's got to be a little more high quality than that. So Second you thing. you have a specific mic? Someone asked, do you have a specific mic you send out? Uh, we always, it's uh, pictured right here, uh, the Samson Q2U microphone. I don't pull a commission from Samson, but I should because I will shout about their microphone from the mountaintops. It costs $75. Uh, it arrives in a very neat little package with a stand and you can plug your headphones right into it. And it is everything that you need for a very, very basic podcast mic for under a hundred dollars. It's, it's really a remarkable piece of equipment. So that's uh, that's my endorsement right there. Got it. Secondly, you can have the best microphone in the world, but if you're sitting in a glass conference room to record, it's going to sound like your podcast was recorded in a fish tank. You need a clean, quiet recording space. And one of my uh, uh, favorite things about watching Twitter over the last year uh, has been seeing NPR reporters and other people in the way that they have had to improvise uh, these clean, quiet recording spaces. That's Ira Glass from This American Life recording in his closet in his Chicago apartment. So you want a small space. Uh, you want a lot of absorbent material. Uh, you want uh, walls within walls to keep outside noise, dogs barking, fire trucks from interfering and more than anything you need something to break up the reflection of sound waves around your space so you don't get an echo then you're going to need a virtual recording platform uh zoom google meetings uh these are all okay options 
Um, but uh, particularly if you want a quality podcast, you're going to want one of the pay services out there that lets you record in multi-track. Uh, so Riverside or Squadcast, something like that. And then you'll need uh, some editing software. A lot of people don't realize this, but if you have Photoshop on your computer, you probably already have access to Adobe Audition. It's included in the Adobe suite, and it is one of the finest pieces of audio editing software out there. It's how we produce all of our podcasts here. But if you don't have Adobe Suite, uh, Audacity is a piece of free software that does mm, 60% of what Audition does, uh, handles some of the really basic editing and, and can uh, help you get through there. And finally, you need, again, a, a podcast file hosting service. There are free options that are out there, uh, and they'll tell you how many people are listening. Uh, there are cheap options that give you some more tools in the toolbox. Um, and then the industry standards, uh, the big ones, Megaphone or Libsyn, uh, those will cost you a little bit, but again, it's not an untoward investment. Uh, so with that said, I should really stop talking here and see if there are any questions uh, from the audience. And first, I have to stop sharing my screen. Um, so, oh my goodness, yeah, we've got some questions here. All right, I am going to start it, and please feel free to jump in as well. <laughs> Lynn asking if I have any relation to Chris and Deb in Stoughton. And yes, those are my parents. Um, so you found, you found them. Um, we are, here we go. Uh, question from Community Foundation. We are interviewing most of our guests over Zoom right now. Not everyone has a microphone beyond their computer mic. What can I do in post editing to make that audio sound great? And it pains me to say it. There is nothing that you can do to save bad audio. That is why I will preach from a soapbox about having a good microphone and a good recording space. Um, because working with audio, doing any sort of audio or video, or video production is kind of like an hourglass. And the quality of your audio and video is going to be determined by the pinch point on that hourglass. So if you have a, a great microphone, and uh, a great post-production and a great uh, venue to view it or listen to it, it's going to sound great all the way through. But if you have a good microphone and terrible post-production, this is what you're going to hear right there. And the same goes for if you have a bad microphone, but then you've got Skywalker sound doing the post-production, there's still nothing they can do to make that bad microphone sound like it was a good microphone. Sure. Uh, so you need to make sure that quality is uh, incorporated into every step. Um, Carrie, Eva has a question about the internal employee contest. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, the idea there was to uh, get people to provide mm -hmm. rankings and reviews uh, so that you could sort of almost weaponize uh, <laughs> the internal like podcast algorithms of Apple podcasts and Google um, yep. to get more, more views and more listens to your podcast content. Yep. So basically we gamified this uh, promotion. So it went along for a month. Um, every week we centered around one full episode and we would uh, communicate with employees via email at the beginning of the week that this new episode is launched. Go listen to it on Apple or Spotify. You get a ticket for entry if you leave a review, ticket for entry if you subscribe, and ticket for entry if you leave five stars. So they really had a chance to triple their opportunities. Uh, in terms of like 300 employees, I would venture to say we had maybe 50 who regularly contributed. Um, so it was a good way to go from like zero to some sort of audience right off the bat. Uh, thank you for that, Carrie. We have a question here from Laura, uh, who has a great topical question. Um, very recently, Apple and now Spotify have both announced that they will allow podcasters uh, to offer paid subscriptions. In other words, subscribe to my premium feed and you can get ad-free content or you can get extra content. So for $3.99 a month, you can tune into the Lead Balloon podcast. This isn't true yet. I haven't taken this step and probably don't plan to anytime soon. Um, but you can get subscribers who pay extra for extra bonus ad-free content. Uh, Laura wants to know how I think that type of podcast or, or branded podcasting is going to change with the monetization through subscriptions. 
Um, I don't see it having a big impact on the sort of branded content marketing that we do here, only because uh, our clients at PodCamp Media, um, they're treating this almost as an ad spend, right? They're producing this podcast uh, and it's an expenditure um, to help them generate new leads or to inform and engage their stakeholders uh, or whatever. And so getting a subscription fee from those people maybe isn't the foremost goal there. But I do know that in other areas, it's having a huge impact on the podcast landscape. As a, for instance, I've been speaking recently with, uh, I'm not going to name them, but a magazine publisher who wants to repurpose their content uh, as a podcast. And they've been having trouble with the business case there. It costs this much and we need it to generate this much revenue to be worth it. And they were hoping to do that via ad monetization. And, and that's still an uphill slog. It's doable, um, but it takes time. But now with this subscription fee, all of a sudden that opens up a whole new revenue source for, uh, for them to repurpose uh, their content that way. Uh, Eva wanted to know, uh, for video, do you use B-roll or a graphic with a sound wave? Um, sometimes, well, there are a lot of different options there. And, uh, you know, I know everybody has to get back to work this afternoon. Um, but actually, I can show you some of the uh, the video promotions that we do here uh, in a little bit. If you guys want to hang around for extra innings, I'll, I'll show off a, a few of those. Um, a lot of the times what we actually do is just use video of the recording session itself. Sometimes we intercut that with some B-roll. Uh, the graphic with a sound wave, that's sort of the, the cheap and quick way to do it. And so sometimes that's an option, um, but uh, it's not. Uh, uh, usually we like to go a little bit further and make something a little more engaging than that. Lisa has a great question here about the recommended budget range for creating a podcast. Um, and, uh, that's going to depend on a number of factors. So what I'm going to give you here is a very broad strokes version, but the factors that influence the budget for creating something like this, uh, have to do with a, the level of complexity. Are you just doing a basic show with one segment, a host and guest asking questions and getting answers? Um, how long are the episodes? Are you doing 10 minute episodes or 45 minute episodes? Uh, what sort of cadence are you coming out on? And are there economies of scale uh, that you can reap from producing episodes weekly versus monthly or something like that? Um, and uh, a whole bunch of other factors that go into it. But I like to tell people that broadly, if you're looking to do a podcast, um, you probably want to plan to budget somewhere between two and six or seven or even eight thousand dollars an episode uh depending again on how complex how short um and all of that uh marion fraley wants to know how do we prepare ourselves to be a guest on a podcast uh wow that is a whole nother uh, uh yeah. i mean i can do an entire hour session on that um and uh and so marion i'd actually i'd love to talk to you offline about that let me uh click through here and display the uh, the contact information for that. Um, whoops, I lost it. There we go. I am happy to talk through and answer any other questions that, uh, that you guys have. Please feel free to uh, reach out. Uh, Dusty at podcampmedia.com is the email address. Uh, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Uh, Carrie is on those things as well. And podcampmedia.com is the website there. Um, but I see that we have reached the uh, one o'clock point here. So I will uh, uh, stick around here a little bit longer if anybody has any other questions. Otherwise, thank you so much, Carrie, for uh, joining me here. And Christine, PRSA of Southeast Wisconsin, thank you guys so much for having us. It has been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having for coming, Dusty. It's been amazing. This is great information. Thank you so much. Yeah, if anyone else has questions, feel free to stay on and ask Dusty as long as that's okay with you. <laughs> Sounds good. I am not going anywhere at this point. So, <laughs> yeah, um, if, you, if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and jump in. Hey, I have a question. How's it going, Dusty? Oh, there's um, trouble. <laughs> if you, uh, 
are by chance, I'm sure, you know, invited to a podcast, this goes for anybody, not just to you specifically, what are some things you'd look for to whether or not to determine if it's a good match to be a guest on, on another person's podcast or another company organizations? Uh, my first step, honestly, is always just to tune into the podcast um, a little bit. Uh, I, I like to think that the best way to determine um, whether or not somebody's show is a good fit is to just get a sense for their track record, what they produce on a regular basis. Um, I think that if you listen to somebody else's podcast in the first five minutes, you should get a very good sense of who their audience is, whether that audience is applicable to you. Uh, what sort of style they have. Uh, is this going to be a good venue for you to get your message across or is this going to be uh, trouble? Frankly, if you listen to somebody's podcast for five minutes and you don't get an idea of who their audience is, it's probably not a great podcast. Like if, if they're putting the time and the effort into being precise and concise with their message, with, uh, with, who they're targeting and, and what the objectives are the pod, of the podcast are, uh, it's going to be apparent when you listen to that first five minutes of the program. And uh, if it's just, you know, three dudes sitting around in a basement drinking beers, that's going to be pretty apparent too. And that's probably not a show that you want to do. Um, so certainly that's a great place to start. Similarly, check out the podcast website, see what they have going on. Um, check out their social media feeds and, uh, and, and really usually you can get a pretty good, uh, idea of, uh, of, uh, what the show is and, and whether or not it's an opportunity for you. Thanks. Thank you. Those, uh, former Madison media people always coming in with the hardball questions. Got to watch out for them. Good to see I'm a brand. for now though, but yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, I do a follow up if, 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 if you, if you will, um, if you do choose to go on another podcast or anyone in general, and there's maybe kind of like sensitive issues or like uh, no fly zones. I mean, what, did, what are your suggestions? Um, you probably get those as a host too. Uh, ways of having that conversation because obviously you want the conversation to be organic and free flowing and long form, but there may be areas you just, just don't necessarily want to go to. So what we do for a lot of the podcasts that we produce here um, is uh, there's there's a whole guest prep process. And, and we started to talk about this a little bit earlier and uh, with Marion's question as well. Um, but uh, usually what I do well, all the time, what I do and, and what a, a good podcast producer does for their guests to help them prepare is provide them with an outline. Um, if we're talking about a 30 to 40 minute podcast episode, then there's probably going to be eight to 10 points on this outline. And I stress to all of them that the podcast outline is not a script, right? This is not, this is not an exact set of directions for how we're going to get from A to B. These are just the points of interest along the way. And so we want the conversation to be natural. We want the conversation to flow organically. But we do want to make sure to hit these eight to 10 points along the way. Those are the signposts that we pass as we're going there. Um, and so uh, it's, uh, it's not untoward as a podcast guest, uh, if somebody invites you onto their show, to be like, hey, can you provide me with just a, a quick outline? And by the way, these are some sensitive topics that I'd like to avoid, if at all possible. Um, it, it, it's not untoward. You're not going out of bounds uh, by requesting that. And anybody that reacts poorly to that uh, is, again, maybe somebody that you don't want to consider appearing on their show. Um, but I, I think that ultimately, by giving somebody a set of signposts like that in the outline, you are helping prepare them for the conversation. Uh, and so you're making them sound better, but you're making your show sound better as a result, too. And so it's just it's a part of the due diligence, uh, I think, that goes into preparing for uh, a podcast recording session. Thank you very much. Good to see you again, Brian. Take care, man. And now for something completely different. Um, what about, uh, I heard but didn't listen to um, Serial. Um, that extended, uh, you know, kind of mystery story or, you know, reality based. Um, are more of those kinds of podcasts oh, being done 
Uh, are they as popular as cereal was? Uh, yes. Uh, so cereal was produced actually as an offshoot of This American Life, one of the longest standing uh, sort of immersive audio storytelling formats that exists. Uh, Sarah Koenig was originally a producer on This American Life and then uh, branched out and did serial. But um, this is this is something that I actually I, I like to remind people of is a podcast doesn't just have to be a Q&A. A podcast doesn't have to be a host and a guest talking about a topic of the week. Um, and yeah, what we have seen uh, in the world of podcasting is that 98% of podcasts are very simple, but the podcasts that put the extra effort into creating that immersive storytelling experience like Serial, like, I'm going to toot my own horn again and I apologize, like Lead Balloon, it's not just a host and a guest, it's more of an immersive experience. We're, we're not just having conversations, we're telling stories. And, and the podcasts that put that extra effort in really tend to stand out in terms of uh, getting and maintaining listener bases and, and fans and uh, growing faster. Um, and in terms of, you know, I, I shouldn't be so vain about such things, but uh, getting awards. Um, here at PodCamp Media, we're a member of the Podcast Academy. It's a, a new organization, but they're trying to do for uh, the world of podcasting um, what the uh, what the Academy has done for the world of filmmaking with the uh, the Academy Awards and uh, and providing opportunities for people in this field to network and learn from one another and to hone the craft of storytelling. And if you look at who brought home the bacon in the uh, inaugural Ambies Awards, the Academy Awards of Podcasting. It's the people and the organizations that really invested in that immersive style of storytelling. And frankly, from my perspective, as someone who is a podcast listener long before I was producing a podcast, those are the sorts of podcasts that uh, I go out of my way to continue to listen to. Um, so when I was flashing earlier through uh, the five steps of content marketing with podcasts, uh, one of the podcasts that I referenced there um, is is a podcast that frankly would not have a lot of interest for most people on this call. It's called 20,000 Hertz, and it is a podcast, it's a storytelling podcast for sound designers, people that work in audio editing. And so they go through and they look at, okay, the 20th Century Fox theme. Brum, bum, brum, bum, brum, bum. How, who, who composed that? What's the story behind where did that come from? Uh, the sound of the T-Rex roaring in Jurassic Park uh, is actually a combination of like uh, a lion and a jet engine and a rhinoceros or, so, or an elephant or something like that. These really like inside baseball nerdy things that have no interest to people outside the sound design industry. Uh, but 20,000 Hertz is put on by a studio in Texas that works with sound designers. And so they wanted to attract the attention of sound designers and created this podcast that provides this immersive storytelling experience about topics that sound designers can get passionate about. So yes, Serial really redefined the podcast space in so many ways. And, and frankly, in a lot of ways that I was really glad to see as a listener and uh, has helped it continue to advance as a place for really great immersive storytelling. Great question, Lynn. Well, stay tuned. Your folks are probably going to be involved in something that I'm up to then over here. <laughs> I love to hear it. <laughs> you won't you won't have trouble talking my dad into uh, any kind of creative scheme. He's Oh uh, my god, he and I have worked with some of the same people and it was yeah, we met at Naughty Norsky. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. Are you are you involved with the uh the uh, Stoughton Stoughton Village Community Players. Theater. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to get. My husband was the one who did the videos that are now on their website about their uh, centennial. Um, so, oh yeah. Excellent. You'll Love run to into see us. It. Yep, <laughs> yep. No, that's a lot of fun. Um, well, I know somebody had uh, asked about uh, seeing some examples of video promotion uh, of podcasts. Let me pull back, and I can just show you. A couple that were really 
proud of here. And thank you for hanging with me here while I get this queued up. So there was a, a trend on social media a little bit earlier this year, uh, the hashtag how it started, how it's going. Um, and so I'd, I'd like to start you off here with uh, some examples of how it started, how it's going from the National Corn Growers Association podcast. We're about 21 episodes deep into this project. We launched it in January of 2020. We made it all the way through the pandemic going all virtual and now we're back to occasionally recording in person, but usually still doing virtual. But this is the promo video that we put out on their social feeds prior to even launching the podcast, first and foremost. Matt ought to go in just a second here. It always takes a long time. There's a conversation happening about the future of farming in America, and some folks feel like their voices aren't being heard. But this is our way of life, and that's the heart of what makes America strong. I'm John Doggett. I'm the CEO of the National Corn Growers Association, and I travel all over this great nation of ours working to protect that way of life. And now I'm inviting you to join in on this conversation about the future. My new podcast will take you with me as I talk with those who are shaping the future of agriculture. From the fields of the Corn Belt to the D.C. Beltway, we'll make sure that the growers who feed America have a say in the issues that are important to them. So subscribe now to Wherever John May Roam, the National Corn Growers Association podcast. You can find us on iTunes, Google Play, and wherever else you get your podcasts. Our first episodes are going to come out on January the 22nd, and we're going to have new episodes every month. You can listen from your truck, your tractor, your combine, or wherever else is convenient. So stay tuned to the issues that are important to you, and join me. Whoops, didn't mean to John pause Doggett, down there. Wherever John may roam, from the National Corn Growers Association. So what's always been really cool to me about the National Corn Growers Association podcast is that it's a podcast for corn farmers, but it's not just about growing corn. It's about issues that are tangentially related to that. Now that we're able to do things in person again post-COVID here, uh, I actually just got back about a month ago from a trip that I did with the corn growers to Louisville, Kentucky, where we started at the uh, the bourbon exhibit in the uh, Kentucky State Museum, uh, the Fraser, Kentucky History Museum. And we did two whole podcast episodes just about bourbon. Um, but other uh, things that we've done for them, um, we had on... Uh, CNN's chief White House correspondent. We talked to a three-time Olympic gold medalist um, and, and not necessarily about corn, but about these issues that are pertinent to corn farmers. And so that was the how it started. This is the how it's going that we produced about a year ago. I roam a lot and I'm looking forward to bringing this podcast to different places around the country and having different conversations with different people. I'm going to have some conversations with, with folks that most of our farmers don't hear much from. But who nonetheless are still very, very much a part of what is going on in, in agriculture. This is not a reality TV show. Something like the coronavirus is a real threat. We will better address that threat if we're working as a team. People across this country have the ability the, and the right, and maybe even the responsibility to demand more from the people who represent them at any level. The work around urban farming, what does that teach the kids in, in your programs? We talk about the discipline, we talk about the work ethic, and then they seeing themselves being entrepreneurs and being able to help feed a family and to understand and to appreciate, you know, where food comes from. We have to have a more offensive agenda and conclude new free trade agreements. And we have to strengthen our bilateral relationships and solve problems with the trading partners we already have to make sure that existing trade runs smoothly. I've covered uh, President Bush in office for the Chicago Tribune. I covered President Obama and now I cover President Trump. And uh, next year it will be President Biden. And throughout those different administrations, there's no question the landscape of the media has changed. Go out. Buy a Coors Light, have a Coors Light, literally raise your glass to farmers across America. That was that was the concept, right? And we pushed it, and it was incredible. The response was absolutely amazing.
what this industry has been about. It's been about the land. It's been about community. It's been about family. It's been about our country. We have so much to be proud of. And we're just starting today to build a future that we can be even more proud of years to come. And so we've really just gotten so far outside the original bounds of, of corn growing as a topic, as, as a subject matter, and, and just found different ways to, to tell stories that are relevant to their audience. And, and I'm just real happy with how this project has turned out. Um, this is, uh, so that's, that's sort of uh, to answer the question about promo videos. Um, you know, we like to mix in a, a lot of B-roll and then the footage of the actual recording sessions to promote the uh, uh, the episodes themselves. Again, it's higher effort than just uh, uh, running audio under a, a waveform and a logo, but I think that it's ultimately more engaging and, and more valuable to the brands that uh, we're representing. Similarly, here's another example from the Back of the Napkin, the Shore Payroll podcast of uh, how we promote their individual episodes. And again, this has been produced all virtually. There are two things that you'll find behind every small business. Oh, this is the... A uh, bolt of inspiration <laughs> and a person with big ideas. And that's what we want to celebrate with Sure Payroll's new podcast, Back of the Napkin, where entrepreneurs share stories about their big journeys in small business. I'm Dusty Weiss, a small business owner from the Midwest. And I'm Stephanie Davis from Sure Payroll. And we can't wait to share these stories of invention, reinvention, and innovation from some of the most interesting small businesses in the U.S. In our first season, you'll hear small business stories from a brainstorming guru whose passion is helping other people focus their creative energy. Let's find a lot of ideas before we walk down the aisle with them to make sure that the right idea is the one we actually marry. A serial entrepreneur who found a way to align his struggle for an amazing cup of coffee with his goal to give back to the community especially one with a strong social mission like ours, it comes from something really personal that happens in their life. An animal lover who strives to create a holistic, healing salon experience for all of her furry clients. I just made sure that as I was vetting people, one of the most important things is that they are trained in pet CPR and pet first aid. And a newly engaged couple with a mission to help others plan the wedding of their dreams. So that kind of inspired us to launch Perry Weddings to have all the information in one place that can not only help us, but other couples as well. These are ideas that may have started out on the back of the napkin, but they're changing the world every day in communities across America. Back of the Napkin is brought to you by Sure Payroll, where small business is their business. Our first episodes launch January 27th, so make sure you subscribe now. Just search Back of the Napkin on iTunes, Stitcher, Google, or wherever you get podcasts. So if you're a small business owner or just love a good story, tune in to explore unique ideas that have launched successful enterprises and meet entrepreneurs who aren't afraid to think differently. Join us for Back of the Napkin from Sure Payroll. So that was, I lied, that was not actually an individual episode promotion. That was the promo that we put together for the entire series uh, when we were launching it. But um, lastly, I'm going to skip that one. Ah, excuse me. I did want to show you just one more, uh, sneak one in here from uh, uh, our flagship podcast, Lead Balloon. Um, because this is just one of and my favorite bring episodes. Governor Dukakis, all five feet eight of him. Uh, over to the plant at uh, Sterling Heights, this proven ground, put him in a gray jumpsuit that they would use for any person taking a demo ride, put a helmet on top of him labeled Mike Dukakis on the front, and have him sit in the tank. It was a disconnect between this big idea, perhaps absorbed through the silver screen, and the reality of putting a small man, Governor Dukakis, inside the turret, of that main battle tank. I worked for a while in the realm of political PR, certainly not at a national level, but my former boss, his boss, the city clerk of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, has a saying of which he's quite fond. He likes to say, don't ever be the person in the meeting who hears a bad idea, knows it's a bad idea, but doesn't speak up to say that it's a bad idea. You mentioned your friend Matt Bennett, and from reading your article in Politico, I know that he was that person who spoke up and said, guys, this is not a great idea. Why did it still go forward? I think Matt's quote that at least he wrote to himself contemporaneously in 
a journal that he gave me to originally write the article that then I used to write the book was, guys, this idea sucks. <laughs> Matt, Matt could actually, Matt was actually on site. He could see the angles, Dusty. He knew the way the visual would look. There's an expression or some maxim that goes for these young people who travel the hustings like Matt and myself. You know, that, that the desk always wins. The headquarter, the decision of headquarters is going to prevail despite people like Matt speaking up and saying, they're not going to let Governor Dukakis take your full speed ride of the tank without a helmet on. So, I mean, that, that was just a fun episode for me to produce because I, I remember studying and learning about the Dukakis in a tank fiasco when I was in journalism school. And, uh, and, and so to actually get to speak about it with a, a former White House events director and, and a former White House spokesperson as well, and, and to get their take on it, um, particularly from uh, Josh there, who was a staffer for Dukakis 88 back in the day, uh, it's just uh, a, a wonderful, wonderful story to hear told uh, from the perspective that they have to offer to it. But I think I have gone on uh, long enough uh, talking about myself. So um, unless there are any other questions uh, from uh, you guys, thank you guys again so much. You've uh, been a wonderful audience, and it really has been a, a great, great time getting to uh, share some of the work that we're doing here. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, have uh, a great uh, rest of your Tuesday here, and uh, we'll hopefully talk to you all again real soon. Thanks so much, Dusty. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Christine. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>